In this video, we're going to take a look at a method of proof called strong induction. So what exactly is strong induction? Well, it's a lot like mathematical induction. So if you'll recall our ladder analogy, our ladder analogy said for regular induction, we can get to the first ladder. And if we can get to the kth ladder, then we can get to the k plus one ladder. I'm sorry, rung of the ladder. So now instead of doing that, instead of saying, if we can get to k, we can get to k plus one, it's saying, if we can get to all of the values up to k, then we can get to k plus one. So we're saying we can get to one, we can get to two, we can get to three, we can get to four, and so on. So our basis step is going to be exactly the same. It's still going to be our least element, but our inductive step is going to either um, show for specific values up to k that it's true, or just assume that p of j is true for all of the values from 1 to k. For our first proof, we'll take a look at using strong induction with a range of values. So just as we did before, and if you have not um, already watched the video from 5.1 about mathematical induction, please be sure that you've watched that first so that you understand that this is just a form of mathematical induction. So what we're trying to prove is that n is an integer greater than one, then n can be written as the product of primes. So hopefully we all know a prime number is a number that is divisible only by itself and one. So just as I did in our last video, we're going to start out with p of n. So let p of n be that if n is an integer greater than one, n can be written as a product of primes. Then we're going to use our basis step. Our basis step is for the lowest value. So notice it says an integer greater than one. So our basis step will not be p of one, but p of two. And p of two is true because two is prime. So obviously if two is prime, it can be written as a product of primes, which is two. The inductive step. The inductive step, now instead of saying p of k implies p of k plus one, we're saying p of j, where j is all of the integers from 1 to k, implies p of k plus 1. So, and it will become clear as we look at this proof why we have to use strong induction as opposed to our normal mathematical induction. So for our inductive step, our inductive hypothesis is that p of j is true for 1 is less than or equal to j is less than or equal to k. So basically, I'm sorry, starting at 2. 2 is less than or equal to j is less than or equal to k. That's what we're assuming is true. And of course, what that means, because p of n is a statement, we're saying that j um, can be written as the product of primes. So all the values of j from 2 up to k can be written as the product of primes. So from here, we now have to think about what to prove. So what to prove is that p of k plus 1 is true, which is that k plus 1 can be written as a product of primes. How am I going to do that? Well, sometimes it's helpful to think about what our outcomes are going to be. So if I start to think about the list of the first, you know, small values of n, if n is 2, 2 is prime. If n is the next value, which is 3, 3 is prime. 4 is not prime, but I can write it as 2 times 2, um, which is a product of primes. 5 is prime. Oops. 6 is not prime, but can be written as a product of 2 and 3. And 7 and 8 and 9, and we get the idea. So looking at this, 
I can say that either my value is prime or it is composite and composite can be written um, as a number times some other number. So we're going to say consider two cases, either K is prime, I'm sorry, K plus one, because that's what we're interested in. Either K plus one is prime or composite. So we'll start with case one. K plus one is prime. So what happens if K plus one is prime? Then P of K plus one holds because a prime can be written as a product of primes itself. So then we look at case two where K plus one is composite, not prime. How are we going to show that K plus one can in fact be written as a product of primes? Well, we want to consider our inductive hypothesis just like we did before. So by definition, if K plus one is composite, It can be written as a product of factors. And what are those factors going to be? Well, they're going to be between two, uh, we'll say product of factors A and B, where two is less than or equal to A, is less than or equal to B, is less than k plus 1. So why is that? Well, because we know it's going to start, 2 is the smallest value that can be written, and basically it goes all the way up to less than k plus 1, because if it was k plus 1, then that would have to be a prime number, and we've already said it's not prime. So it's written as the product of two factors. Well, if a and b are less than k plus 1, then that means by our inductive hypothesis, A and B can be written as the product of primes. Why is that important? Because then K plus one is written as the product of the factors or prime factors of A and B. Therefore, obviously, we are writing that as a product of primes. So just in case you didn't follow that logic, let's say A is written as two times three times seven and B was written as three times 11. Well, then K plus one, which is made up of those two factors, would be written as two times three times three times seven times 11. So it would just be the product of the prime factorization of each value. So the question then is, why did we have to use strong induction? Well, think about how we proved this. We proved this by saying all of the values that are less than k plus 1 or all of the values that are between 2 and k can be written as the product of primes. So if I didn't have this inductive hypothesis for the entire range of values, this proof would not in fact work. We're now going to take a look at strong induction using specific values as opposed to assuming it's true for a range of values through k. So we're actually going to find the find that it's true for specific values. So before we get started on this question, I really just want to come up with um, our strategy because you should always think about that when you are doing a proof. Don't just sit down and try to write a proof. You really need to kind of you know noodle through how this is going to work. 
So let's think about 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 cents. Let's think about those in terms of 3 cent and 5 cent stamps. So for 8 cents, I could use 1, 3, 1, 5. For 9 cents, I could use 3, 3s and no 5s. For 10 cents, 0 and 2. For 11, 2 and 1. For 12, 4 and 0. For 13, 1 and 2. And now I could continue from here, um, but obviously I don't have a ton of room. But what I want to be thinking about is my goal of proving that P of K plus 1 is true, right? In my inductive step, that's always where I'm headed. So the question is, what do I have to do here? Which values do I need in order to show that that's true? Well, let's look at this pattern. If I know I have 8 cents, isn't it possible that I can always get 11 cents because I could just add 1 to the number of 3 cent stamps? And for 9, I could just add 1 to the number of 3 cent stamps. And then for 10, I can get 13 by adding 1 to the number of 3 cent stamps. And then guess what? That will continue. So to get 14, I'm just going to add 1 to the number of 3 cent stamps and continue that process for 15, for 16, and so on. So really, I have my idea is I'm only going to need these three values. And then from there, I'm just going to add 3 cents each time. So when I'm doing my my proof, that's how I'm going to do it, is I'm going to use those three values as my initial values. So we're going to let P of N be essentially all of this statement. And I'm not going to rewrite it just for the sake of time. You get the idea. We're going to say P of N is that we can make N, uh, we can make postage of N cents or more using three cent N, I'm sorry, we can make postage of n cents using 3 cent and 5 cent stamps for n greater than or equal to 8. So that's our, our P of n. So now we're going to look at our base basis. We're looking at our initial values. So P of 8 is true um, using 1 3 cent and one five cent stamp. Now, some proofs will show just P of eight for their basis and then they rest in the inductive step. Some will show all three of our initial values in the basis. So I'm just going to show all three here. So P of nine is true using three three cent stamps and P of 10 is true using two five cent stamps. So that's gonna be my basis. And again, you might see only P of eight, and then when you get to the inductive step, you might see the nine and the 10 there as well. But that's our base case or our basis. So then we're looking at our inductive hypothesis. So what are we saying? The inductive hypothesis is the statement that P of J is true for eight is less than or equal to J is less than or equal to K for any K values greater than or equal to 10. And I kind of threw this one in here without talking about it. So let's talk about it. Why did I choose 10? Was it random? Did I just say that looks good enough to me? Is that because it was the last number I found up here? Well, what I'm saying is because I'm adding three cents and I'm trying to prove that P of K plus one is true and I'm going to add three cents to get to P of K plus one, this is really saying that P of K minus two is true because then when I add the three cent stamp, I can show that P of K plus one is true. So that's where I got the 10. Now, obviously, I get the 8 from starting at 8, and J is any value between 8 and K, where K is at least 10. So I'm showing, I'm assuming that it's true for any value between 8 and K, where K is at least 10. 
So how am I going to do that? Well, then I'm going to use my inductive hypothesis. So for the step that I'm doing, I have to show that it's that I can form k plus 1 cents using 3 and 5 cents. So I'm going to say we want k plus 1 cents of postage, postage, sorry, postage. Since k is greater than or equal to 10 by my inductive hypothesis, we know that p of k minus 2 is true, or that we can form p or a k minus 2 sense of postage by adding one three cent stamp we have k plus one cents of postage which is what we wanted so again why did we use specific values because we really only needed those three to show that it's true for all values greater than or equal to eight. Up next, we're going to take a look at recursively defined functions and sets.